everyone. Welcome to the Gender Equality Index 2023 conference organized by the European Institute for Gender Equality from the European Parliament. My name is Federica Di Sario. I'm a climate reporter at Politico Europe and I will be your host today. So the focus of the index this year is all about sustainability and the green energy transition, because we know that women in all their diversities can reap huge profits and benefits um, from the, as the EU embarks on its net zero uh, journey. Uh, but to do so, um, there needs to be sufficient focus on the climate and the gender uh, dimensions. So, um, just a word on practicalities, this event is fully uh, virtual, which means that you can watch us either on IGA's website or on YouTube. But now let me give you a flavor of what to expect. Today we have a total of three sessions and one panel discussion to explore the findings of the, um, of the Gender Equality Index 2023. We will explore um, uh, the progress that has been achieved so far, and we will look at what remains to be done. So we will start by uh, discussing how uh, the Green Deal policies and gender equality are strictly interwoven with two high-level uh, panelists. Um, we'll have uh, Caroline Schiele, she is the director of the European Institute for Gender Equality, IGIF, um, and also uh, Kim Leonard uh, Smouter, he's the Director General of the European Network Against Racism. Welcome both. Thank you. Yeah. Hello. Um, then we will proceed to the part that I'm sure most of you are waiting for, which is um, the, having a presentation about the findings of the Gender Equality Index 2023. Um, and this will be done thanks to one of Agus' uh, senior experts. Next, we will take a deep dive in the lingering uh, gender gaps in unpaid care. This is a tremendously important topic, uh, but sadly also one of the most disregarded ones, and usually because of a lack of data. Um, and last but not least, we'll then um, have a high-level panel discussion. Uh, we will have um, speakers from the governments, from the academia, from the financial sector, and even from the European Parliament itself. Um, and after having heard um, everything we have discussed before, um, we will try to define the, the policies um, that are already being taken <coughs> to uh, bridge uh, the gender gaps, and we will have a look at what, at what remains to be done. Uh, but now, before we start the first session, uh, please let me remind you uh, that um, the interpretation in the international uh, sign language is also available. Um, and also, I would like to encourage you to start thinking about the questions that you would like to ask our speakers, uh, because there will be uh, several occasions during the conference to submit those questions through Slido, and I'll do my best to ask as many questions as possible. Um, but now, um, I'm very excited to um, welcome to the studio again, Caroline Schiele, director um, at IGE, um, and uh, Kim um, Smouter, um, uh, Director General um, at the um, uh, European Network Against Racism again. Uh, my first question is for Caroline. Um, you have been at the lead of IGA for the past three years um, and all your career has been um, about advising EU institutions on how to better um, uh, capture and how to better uh, make sure that the gender perspective um, is um, incorporated across several policies. Uh, my question would be, why do you think it's so important um, that we uh, move towards a green and gender equal Europe? Well, thank you, Frederica, for this question. And to be honest, this is a topic that is very dear to my heart. Um, when we speak about climate change, what I see is that for many people it's overwhelming. There's many things happening that we simply do not understand, let alone that we would understand the connection between gender equality and, and the Green Deal and climate change. And maybe I can share with you a personal experience that I had years ago when I had never thought about any connection be between gender equality and climate change. And this was when I was back in, uh, in 2006 in New York. 
for negotiations in, in the Commission on the Status of Women. And we were talking about participation of women in society and, and the barriers for them. And as the EU, uh, we, we uh, negotiate as an EU together. And, and suddenly one of the developing countries who was also in the room spoke about how in their country, due to the lack of rain and, and the very dry seasons, people who usually went to the water wells to get water, they had to walk longer distances to get the needed water. And then that man said, listen, it's mostly girls and women who leave on a daily basis to get that water and they're easily victims of sexual assault. So for me, that was the first time, really, to really understand that there is a link between climate change and the daily life of people, of women and men, boys and girls, and also the effects of climate change on gender equality, because it's horrible if you think that if you need water, you go and get it, you might be sexually assaulted. You're not safe. Um, so this was for me really an eye-opener and, and I hope that today when we share the, the, the results of the index and also in the years to come, uh, we will also provide those eye-openers to everyone who's working on the issue of climate change and Green Deal and anyone beyond. Uh, it's important that we understand this. My second remark is if we speak about a social and fair transition, for me and for I it means that we should leave no one behind. And one important topic that comes to the table very often now is uh, energy poverty, mm -hmm. lack of energy, but also energy poverty. Many of the measures that governments are taking to combat climate change, they cost money. At the same time, we know that people in poverty in the U European Union are often women. There's again a link, mm -hmm. yeah? So, and my third uh, remark in this sense is that uh, I would like to speak about responsibility. It is important that more women participate in the renewable energy sector, that we have a more equal share of recycling responsibilities at home, more gender balanced env environmental decision making and safer sustainable public trans transport. Uh, and our data today, I hope uh, that we, we help to show, uh, to give the evidence that there is still much room for improvement eh, because women are not visible. And, and maybe to, to, to end uh, my response, uh, Frederica, I think we all have a responsibility in, uh, in combating climate change and, and hope also in today's discussions it will become mm -hmm. clear how also at an individual level, mm -hmm. as citizens, uh, we, can, we can add to uh, combating climate change. I will leave it to that. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Carleen. Thank you for giving us such a personal answer as well. And now coming to you, Kim, I have a kind of similar question because we obviously we all agree with that. But I really want to understand from you, uh, why do you think it's so important that governments now act um, on this uh, swift implementation of the Green Deal policies? We know that the um, EU institutions have worked on a tons of climate legislations, but why is it important that in their implementation they do it in, a, in an inclusive way? Thank you for the question. And I think it goes back to, I think, Carolina's point around the, you know, the very poignant story about developing countries and that impact. Well, that impact is not just in developing countries. And I think that's also why it's so important for us to be looking at the climate change agenda as not just an issue which is about you know, fixing, fixing and ensuring that the temperatures go down to the right level, mm -hmm. but that actually in order to make the systemic changes that are required to make climate change a reality or to stop you know, climate change from becoming a reality, you need to be taking into account many different dimensions, and one of which is the social dimension. Um, we at the European Network Against Racism have been looking very closely at that intersection, that, that interlink between discriminations and climate change. And there's two reasons why that's really important. One, the first reason, I think, is, is what we were talking about. So really the, the issue of resilience and the ability of certain communities to actually be able to react to the changes and the impact that climate change will have on communities. And that's not something which is theoretical. It's happening already today. So energy poverty is, is an example of that. 
but we also see certain, certainly in the placement of certain products and services in, in underprivileged communities and the health impacts that it has and the long-term impact it has on the ability of certain communities to develop. So there is a very strong interlink between the policies that are being put in place, the ability of communities to be resilient to the change that is coming, and the importance the government has to play in ensuring that they're, you know, in, in anticipating what those changes might be, in ensuring that services are being delivered to communities which are really not prepared for the kinds of changes that we're going to be seeing, but also to accompany and to ensure that marginalized groups are actually heard and are actually part of the conversation. Because one of the other issues that we're seeing is that um, a lot of the new changes that are being implemented to try to address climate change are not being done in partnership with marginalized communities. And so what you're seeing is that there's also increasing resistance to efforts to try to, come to curb climate change because, in fact, marginalized communities see that the things are being imposed upon them as opposed to being discussed with them. And the dimension then becomes really important because those who are least heard are often marginalized women and their lived experiences, how they're being experiencing climate change is not being heard. And it's important for governments to listen to that and to ensure that the policies are not being done against them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Kim, for raising the, this important aspect. Indeed, we need to develop policies that are also, it's not simply that they need to be implemented in an inclusive way, but they also need to be drafted in an inclusive exactly. way. That's, yeah. a, that's a right point. Um, and now, um, Carleen, back to you. Um, I mean, we are here because of the uh, release of the Gender Equality Index, which I'm sure involved a lot of data crunching. Um, so my, uh, my question is about the role of data. How important do you think it is to have the right data to drive evidence-based policymaking to tackle gender um, inequalities? Well, action stems from knowledge. And I have been a policy advisor and I have been working on policies on gender equality in, in my, my country back home. And I mean, you simply cannot do this without data and evidence. I take it that every government wants to develop the best policies ever for their citizens. And if that's your goal, then you need to understand what are the needs of women and men in all their diversity in your member state. And I mean, as a director of, uh, of the Knowledge Center on Gender Equality in the European Union, I can only stress how important our data and evidence are. And, and going back to the Green Deal, uh, as I said before, for many it's such a complicated issue as such climate change and the Green Deal. And also to be honest, if I may say so, when I look at the text of the Green Deal, it's, it's very difficult to find any references to, to gender equality. Mm -hmm. So the more important it is that we as an institute, how we make visible what are the needs of, of men and women in society. Um, and in that, in that uh, area, we focus now mostly on energy and transport. So we, what we will do, uh, we will provide uh, the relevant evidence and data for all member states and governments, but also for the European Union, to really reflect on the actual needs and situations, the status quo of women and men in all their diversity in the European Union, because only if you use that data and evidence, you're able to respond adequately to your policies. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and Kim, uh, also a very similar question about the importance of data, because I, I think you also have a background in social research, so who better than you can tell us <laughs> how important it is to have the, the right data and research at, at, at hand, and what they can allow us to do um, in terms of tackling gender inequalities? Yeah, I mean, equality data is so important, as, as was mentioned, and, and I think for a number of reasons. I think one of the reasons why it's, it's very important is, first of all, to measure actually how, how big the problem is. And without data, it's very difficult to actually understand, you know, are we dealing with an issue which is affecting a particular group, the entire community? Is it a big issue, small issue? Without data, we have just anecdotal evidence, which is mm -hmm. it's just inadequate in order to create new policies. 
data is also really important not just to measure the, the status quo. It's also very important to measure are we actually progressing in the direction that we think we're progressing. And for us, that's another reason why it's very important to have data sets available. It is also one of the reasons we're actually fighting very hard to ensure that as uh, the European institutions are thinking about the, the collecting and the reporting of data, for example, by private sector to ensure that they're meeting their ESG requirements, that they actually also think about the equality dimension of it. Because if you actually are trying to address climate change, you need to also be thinking about equality elements. You need to be understanding how these different measures are actually creating a true impact across the board. Data is really helpful to actually determine that. Without data, you're not able to detect the nuances and you actually might be working on with lots of blind spots. And that's what data is really great for. Data is great for identifying these are the blind spots. It's great for identifying are we actually making progress. And without it, we might still be thinking that we're doing a huge, you know, lots of changes, but actually data often shows the opposite. And I would also add it's often an excellent way to also talk about the things which are not talked about. So there are lots of discussions which might be taboo. But by having it through data, we are actually able to release and to reveal taboos which, which may not even be aware of. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, and now, Carleen, um, um, another uh, question to you. So um, you mentioned before the fact that everybody can do something uh, about uh, gender equality. Um, it doesn't really need to be policymakers. Of course, it's very uh, recommended that policymakers become more sensitive towards the issue, uh, but it's not just about them. It's also businesses, it's also academia, and just individuals like you and me. Um, so can you tell us, uh, just trying to be very uh, tangible, very concrete, what would be your three steps forward to, um, to um, help Europe go towards a more gender equal uh, version of itself? Yeah, thank you. Um, before I move to the three steps forward that Eige wants to share today, maybe I first explain why we launched that campaign, Three Steps Forward, last year. Because I realized that in many of my interventions, mm -hmm. also in the past years when I spoke about the results of the Gender Equality Index, I realized that often I said, listen, we take one step forward and two steps back. Um. And not only is that, of course, a very, let's say, depressing message, but, mm -hmm. but I also realized that with all the knowledge not only Eiger has, but many of us have. If we join forces, we can really make a change. So that's why, um, as an institute, we decided to invite, let's say, everyone to formulate their three steps forward. So policymakers, uh, governments, ministers, everyone who wants to participate in our campaign, please formulate you three steps forward. It's For us, it's, it's hope-based communication because we really think that on the basis of data and information and with our knowledge and capacities, we can really make a change. But we also should join forces in that. Mm -hmm. So we launched that campaign last year. We invited many of our, let's say, allies okay, to formulate their three steps forward. They do this uh, on social media. And um, it, it gives new spirit. It gives a spirit of hope, mm -hmm. of, of um, really realizing we can make a change. So, and if it comes down to Eige, what I can tell you is that our three steps forward are and will continue to be. We will continue to provide evidence. That's the first step. So data and information that are extremely relevant. The second step, uh, we will continue to build coalitions and to engage in conversations as we do today and we will specifically also focus on the Green Deal and gender equality in the coming, in the coming years. And finally, we will share our know-how. Okay? We will provide concrete tools that anyone can use to implement gender equality in their portfolio and specifically also in, in the Green Deal policies. Mm -hmm. And we will also share good practices. So that's the three steps forward that I would like to put on the table today. And you can count on Aiko for that. Thank you so much, Caroline. And now, I guess, same question to you, Kim. So what would be your three steps forward? And uh, also on behalf, of course, of the European Network Against Racism. Yeah, I mean, for us, I think there's, there's the three steps forward. The first one, I think, is around 
ensuring that the voices of the unheard are actually heard. And I think for us, it's really building and working with civil society, grassroots organizations, ensuring that they are equipped and that they are able to actually influence the debate and that they are given enough space to actually make their, their, their cases heard, particularly here in the European, at the European level. I think that's really an important one. The second one, I think, for us is, is really telling also and ensuring and recreating the information about the impact that actually climate change is already having on marginalized communities throughout Europe and making that story heard. So we've actually published a year ago a report which made the intersection between racial justice and climate justice. Mm -hmm. And we're going to continue that journey to, ex to explain our knowledge and our understanding of how these different elements are interacting with each other and creating, unfortunately, negative results for our communities. The third one, I think, is, and I, and I join Aige, it's around if we're looking to create and achieve systemic change, then we need the system to work in unison. And to make that, that happen, we need broader coalitions. We need to involve civil society organizations. We need to work with governments. We need to work with think tanks. We need to work with private sector. And all of us need to work together in order to actually ensure that we're not leaving anyone behind. And that's for us our three important steps forward to actually make of lasting systemic change, which ensures that, you know, in 25 years, we are talking about a very different reality. Mm. And we hope so. Thank you so much both. Thank you, Corlene. Thank you, Kim. And now it's time to speak about the findings of the Gender Equality Index 2023 itself. But first, let's watch a short video together about the index.